Welcome to the Florida Bar Young Lawyers Division's Technology Committee's CLE webinar series. Today's program is part of a how-to series aimed at helping young lawyers learn the basics of representing clients. This program is entitled, From Initial Client Meeting to Pre-Suit Settlement, How to Represent a Personal Injury Client Pre-Suit. My name is Margaret Good, and I represent the 12th Circuit of the Florida on the Florida Bar Young Lawyers Division Board of Governors, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to a shareholder in my firm, Keith DeBose, who will be presenting today on this topic. As I mentioned, Keith is a shareholder at the law firm of Matthews Eastmore, a Sarasota-based firm who, that provides full-service civil litigation representation. We represent clients in business, commercial, medical, and legal malpractice cases, and of course, we represent plaintiffs in personal injury actions. Keith is an accomplished personal injury attorney at Matthews Eastmore. He's well-respected in Sarasota and throughout the state. He's currently serving as the president of the Sarasota County Bar Association and is very involved in the local community. Keith, thanks so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Margaret. And I'd like to thank the uh, YLD for allowing me this opportunity to talk uh, briefly about uh, personal injury cases and trying to resolve personal injury cases prior to filing lawsuit. Um, again, the, the title of this uh, webinar is From Initial Client Meeting to Pre-Suit Settlement, How to Represent a Personal Injury Client Pre-Suit. Um, I was asked to, to present something to help young lawyers uh, in the field of personal injury uh, when it comes to representing clients, uh, specifically in claims prior to litigation, prior to filing a lawsuit. And I uh, just have some things that I do typically and try to follow when, um, when moving forward with the claim or when a client comes into my door. Um, as Margaret mentioned, I am a shareholder in the law firm of Matthews Eastmore here in Sarasota. Uh, I specialize in personal injury, medical malpractice, but the bulk of my work is related to personal injury, be it automobile accidents, slip and falls, uh, and premises liability claims. I'm a... Uh, Went to Duke University, and I played on the ACC conference team there with uh, Coach Spurrier, who was a head coach at that time. And uh, for all you Gators, we uh, trained Coach Spurrier on how to be a good football coach before he actually came to Florida. I uh, went to the University of Florida uh, College of Law, and I'm, as Margaret mentioned, I'm uh, currently the president of the Sarasota County Bar Association and president of our area United Way. Um, I, I spend time uh, when I'm not practicing law and doing other things, uh, working with uh, young kids here in Sarasota and giving a chance to talk with them about the practice of law and making good choices in life. Now, why did the YLD ask me to do this presentation? DuBose knows. Uh, that's why they asked me. Actually, I owed Margaret a favor, and that's the reason I'm doing this uh, presentation today, but I'm happy to do it. Um, we'll start with the first slide with a potential client. Um, what happens when that potential client calls after being in an accident. Um, we try to gather basic personal information about the client. Obviously, we get their name, telephone number, um, email address if possible. We also want to make sure we get uh, a backup contact in case there is a difficulty getting in contact with the client. If we do that, uh, we'll do that for informational purposes and just to get in touch with the client. If we're going to talk substantively about the claim, we do have a form that we ask the client to sign uh, for authorization to talk to another party about their claim. We get the names of all the parties involved in the accident and a brief description of the accident itself. Uh, this is typically done by the legal assistant and in some cases the paralegal will gather this information uh, about the parties involved, names, ages, uh, addresses of those involved in the accident and a brief description of what happened in the accident. We'll also try to get at that time uh, the names of any witnesses, contact information, and if possible, a statement uh, by any of those witnesses. Uh, this is important because you have witnesses that uh, will, will witness an accident, and if you wait too long, the, the, obviously there's a possibility that they may forget important facts that may help determine liability for your client. Uh, particularly in situations where maybe it's a parking lot situation um, or a situation where there's only your driver and the other party and it's going to be a he said versus she said situation, that witness is uh, crucial to determining liability. Uh, the insurance companies um, 
will sometimes dispute liability. Um, we, we have situations where one client will run a stop sign and hit your, your client. The insurance company may try to decide a portion of liability on your client uh, due to them being able to stop. Uh, obviously, a witness in that category or in that situation can certainly be beneficial because they will be able to um, be a witness for your client to say, no, this person ran a stop sign. There's no liability for your client. Um, the other thing we try to do is we make sure the client secures any evidence that may help with their case. Uh, that's photos of the vehicle, um, accident scene, surveillance video, um, black box system of your vehicle if, it, if your car has a black box. Uh, if you have a slip and fall, you may want to preserve any clothing or shoes that you were wearing at the time. The clothing may have stains in it that may show the type of substance your client may have slipped. Uh, shoes obviously will show what type of traction your client had, what type of shoes they were wearing at the time they fell. Um, I, I do want to go back to uh, the accident scene in the vehicle. Obviously, the first thing you want your client to do is to get medical treatment and not take pictures at the scene. So you want to get a family member to the scene uh, or if the vehicle is towed, get someone to the tow yard as quickly as possible before any repairs are made to get uh, pictures of the vehicle. You can always go back to the accident scene to get photos of the accident scene, and, and I recommend getting photos um, of all directions, especially the, the direction of travel of your client. Uh, the video surveillance can come in handy, and um, those are situations. We actually had a situation where uh, there was an accident at a four-way stop, and there was a question about liability, but luckily there was a food, a quick, like a, a 7-Eleven, a convenience store at the corner that had video surveillance pointed out at the, um, the gas stations or the gas tanks, and it happened to pick up um, the accident, which was crucial to our case because at that point we were no, t no longer talking liability. We were only talking damages. Uh, so you may want to take a uh, pan the area of the accident to see if there are any stores around that may have captured the accident on video uh, because a picture goes or video goes uh, a long way in uh, preserving the issue of liability on behalf of your client. The next thing we do is we specifically tell our client not to speak with anyone about their case, uh, especially insurance companies, uh, about the accident or making any admissions. Uh, I will occasionally allow my clients to talk to their insurance company about uh, to set up the PIP claim. Uh, when, the, when the case comes in, there are essentially three areas that you'll have to deal with, um, the property damage portion of it the personal injury protection portion of it, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and the bodily injury portion of it, which we'll also talk about later. Um, with regard to the property damage claim, that's something that I usually allow the client to deal with. Uh, they talk directly with the insurance, uh, the insurance adjuster to determine a fair value for their vehicle if it's being totaled. If it's being repaired, they will work with the repair company uh, and the insurance company to make sure the necessary repairs are done. If there are problems, we are here on behalf of the client to resolve those issues with the insurance adjuster. Uh, with regard to your PIP claim, uh, again, we allow a statement to be made to the insurance company, but we request the insurance company have us present during that conversation. Um, the PIP statement is a statement that's required under your insurance contract. In order to get those personal injury protection benefits, you have a duty to cooperate, or your client rather has a duty to cooperate with the insurance company and one of those ways is to give a recorded statement if requested. So if that recorded statement is requested by the insurance company, we will ask our client to give our name and contact information to the adjuster and set up a three-way telephone conference or a conference here in our office for our client to give a statement. If the other side asks for a statement, we do not give recorded statements to the other side uh, during pre-suit situations. The next thing we do is we specifically tell the client to uh, seek medical detention if necessary. Uh, this is an area you have to be careful because you don't want to be in a situation where you're recommending a doctor for your client because one of the major questions that one of the questions that comes up during deposition if the case eventually goes to trial is how did you find out about Dr. such and such? Um, and the answer that you never want to have is my lawyer told me to go to Dr. such and such. So hopefully they have a referral base of friends who may have been involved in an accident or they may have some uh, 
uh, physicians that they have seen in the past. Now, one of the things they will try to do is go to their primary care physician. Uh, primary care physicians will routinely not treat clients, even long-standing patients of theirs who've been involved in accidents because they just don't want to get involved in that process. So what you'll find in most of your cases is that the vast majority of your treatment is rendered by either a chiropractor, neurologist, or an orthopedic physician, uh, with, with most of that service being rendered by a chiropractor, at least initial uh, consultation. Uh, the other places, also the uh, emergency room or emergent care facilities, uh, will also treat patients initially. Um, so those are the locations that we would uh, recommend uh, patients to go to. Go to the emergency room if they're uh, or urgent care uh, because you can't go wrong there. Uh, what happens after the call? Uh, what happens in our office is we will uh, run a conflict check to make sure we haven't represented the other party in any action or we aren't currently representing the party in, in a current action. Uh, and we'll also do some brief, um, just a brief research and looking at the claim to see just kind of where it stands and if it's going to be something that's going to be lucrative for us to take on. Because you have to remember, and, and I had to learn this the hard way, being from Sarasota, I got calls from a lot of people uh, when I first started practicing law. And what I had to, what I was reminded or what I was told by one of my partners was that the $2,000 claim takes up just as much as, just as much time as your $200,000 claim, and it's usually with a lot less client satisfaction. Uh, so you have to do at least some initial um, review of the claim to make sure it's worthwhile before you proceed to, down the path of representing a client. The initial client meeting. Um, what is it um, you want to bring to that initial client meeting? Or what, are you, what is it you want to have the client bring to that initial meeting? Uh, we ask for the driver's license. Uh, obviously, we need to verify who we're representing, uh, that they have a valid Florida driver's license. Automobile insurance cards, uh, not just theirs, but we ask for them to bring any and all automobile insurance cards for anyone living in their household because uh, in some situations if there's not enough insurance on behalf of the tortfeasor, the person causing the accident that is, um, there may be the possibility that other insurance uh, provided by those living in the home may afford coverage. Uh, health insurance cards, uh, including Medicare and Medicaid, we also get those. After your PIP benefits have been exhausted, uh, your health insurance will kick in and start paying any medical expenses that your client incurs. Uh, photos of the vehicle, again, uh, photos of any injuries. If the client has any bruising, scarring, uh, swelling that's visible, cuts that are visible, uh, uh, we ask them to take pictures and document that initial injury. Uh, once again, you see names of witnesses. We ask them to bring those uh, in the event we don't already have that information. Uh, estimate of the vehicle. Uh, insurance companies look at the damage to the vehicle when they determine, uh, when they factor in how much they're going to evaluate uh, a claim. Um, so we ask the client to bring in that vehicle estimate uh, so that we know what type of uh, damage is done to the vehicle uh, when we start negotiating with the insurance company. Um, any documents received are related to the crash. If the client has received um, statements from another party, if they receive documents from the insurance company right away, um, a business card or card from anyone that may have been at the scene, we ask them to bring all of those documents in with them at the time of that initial meeting. <clears throat> Again, at that initial meeting, we remind the client that conversations with others uh, will waive the attorney-client privilege. So we, we, we inform them to be careful about conversations that they make, and we specifically tell them not to talk about the accident uh, at that time. The information to gather during the initial client meeting. <clears throat> what we want to gather at that initial client meeting, we have the client here in our office, or if the client is unable to travel, I will make uh, a trip to the client's home or to the hospital, depending on where the client is at the time. Um, but we get detailed facts of the accident at that point. Uh, including any bad facts that may uh, <clears throat> hurt us in the long run. So uh, what typically happens in that situation, uh, we, we have the luxury of having uh, our paralegal to sit in in that initial meeting to take notes and make sure we get all the information we need uh, related to the accident. 
Uh, we take statements from witnesses and other parties if there are any. Uh, if a witness is available and can be called, we may at that time make telephone calls to witnesses to ask them what information they may have relative to the accident. Uh, we get information on prior accidents that our clients have been involved in. Um, we make sure um, that we find out uh, because the insurance companies will find out uh, if we don't. Uh, and it always looks bad if the client uh, hasn't or if we haven't checked on prior accidents. We're getting to the stage where we're negotiating with the insurance company and the insurance adjuster says, hey, you know your client had three prior accidents where they had similar injuries. Um, then it really doesn't look you, make you look very well. Um, some examples that you might have um, of bad facts are, you know, your client, um, you know, could have been uh, using a phone, or uh, your client could have um, not been going to speed limit. They they may have been going slightly over the speed limit. So we want to know exactly how fast they were going. We want to know if they were. Uh, if they had their seat belt on. Those are, those are things that we want to know right up front because if we know that they didn't have their seat belt on, we can, we can defend against that or we can prepare our demand accordingly. Uh, if they were speeding, we can talk about, um, we can address that initially as well and, and talk about braking speed and other factors that uh, the client may have um, been able to use in order to avoid the accident uh, when the insurance company brings that up. Um, prior injuries. We want to know certainly if our client has had similar injuries uh, before um, during that initial meeting because that will certainly influence the value of the claim and how the insurance company looks at this either as a new injury or an exacerbation of a pre-existing injury. Uh, we want to know if the client was receiving any treatment relative to any prior injuries at the time of the accident or if any treatment had been uh, completed and if they had been uh, able to resume their normal lifestyle prior to this accident. Uh, information on personal matters that may affect the case. Uh, prior criminal records, uh, we have to ask our client all the time uh, if they have any prior criminal history uh, because that certainly goes to credibility. It can certainly uh, influence, and it does influence insurance adjusters. Unfortunately, a person who has a criminal record, um, I have seen it happen with insurance adjusters they will give uh, less value to those claims um, because if it, if it does not get resolved, uh, you are asked if you've ever been uh, convicted of a felony or a crime involving dishonesty. Uh, and if that answer is yes, you know, certainly if that is a correct statement, that's all they can ask, but that certainly goes to how a jury may view your client's credibility. Uh, one other issue that um, you, you want to find out is if your client has any child support liens. Uh, I had a claim uh, where our client, it was a $10,000 policy, uh, but our client had $15,000 in child support liens. Um, so at that point, you know, it, it really makes the case cost prohibitive uh, because the client is going to wonder what they're going to get out of the claim. And unfortunately, with that child support lien, child support lien will try and grab any and all money that's available uh, prior to uh, the client getting $1. Um, so those are things that we want to try to gather during that initial client meeting. Uh, key information to provide during uh, the initial client meeting. Communication uh, and managing expectations uh, is important. Um, you want to talk with the client at that time about the time frame uh, for your pre-suit settlement. I usually tell clients that it's a six to nine month process um, before we can start negotiating with the insurance company. And that process can be shorter. Uh, it, can, it can extend to a longer period of time. It just depends on the nature of your client's injuries. It depends on how consistent they are with their treatment. It depends on the medical provider. And it depends on how they respond to treatment. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to settle. I tell clients all the time we don't want to settle a claim too quickly because once you sign that release, um, you know, you, you get to a point where you, you're feeling pretty good after an accident and you say, hey, Keith, uh, clients say, hey, Keith, I want to settle my case right now. We're three months into it. I'm feeling fine. Um, you know, even though I discourage it, they want to settle the claim. They, they accept the offer from the insurance company. We settle it, sign the release, and four or five months later, after they've gotten back involved in a routine uh, daily issues, uh, daily uh, routine, um, they start having pain and they realize it's related to the auto accident, they wonder what they can do, and at that point it's too late. We've signed the release, and they've uh, negotiated a settlement with their insurance company. So 
we want to make sure the client gets an opportunity to get the benefit of, of the full range of medical treatment. We also want to make sure that they get back into their activities of daily living and their regular routine to see if they're going to have any problems that mount up after treatment may have concluded. What we also discussed at that time uh, was not being able to settle um, pre-suit and what happens if we can't settle pre-suit. Uh, probably about 90% of our claims are being settled pre-suit at this time, but there are those claims where we're so far apart with the insurance company or the insurance company has such a low value on the claim, um, or in some instances the client has an unreasonable expectation of the value of their claim that we just can't settle it. So we have to let the client know that there is a possibility that if we can't um, resolve the claim with the insurance company that we will need to file suit. We go through that and I'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that when we uh, go over the settlement state or the uh, statement of client rights and the contract for representation. Uh, we go over uh, what I generally tell patients, uh, clients at that time is that a good medical result is usually a bad legal result. And what I mean by that is that the client gets in a bad accident and liability is clear and they're ex um, um, exacerbating circumstances, um, aggravating circumstances rather, um, like the driver was a drunk driver and, um, and, and he ran a red light, but uh, for whatever reason your client has no injuries uh, and gets no medical treatment. That claim, although it could have been a lot worse, and clients always speak in the term of, I could have been uh, badly injured. I could have been killed. Uh, unfortunately, insurance companies don't pay for what could have happened. They pay for the actual damage and actual injuries that your client sustained. So if your client has a great medical recovery and doesn't have any medical treatment, that's a bad legal claim. It, it, it's not going to amount to very much in the way of a recovery for your client. So I tell them that. Uh, obviously, I want my clients to have a good medical result um, um, as opposed to wishing bad health on anyone. Um, and I guess that's probably the sadistic nature of, of what we do as personal injury lawyers because our, our best clients don't uh, walk into our office. We visit them in the hospital because they're so badly injured, which um, is kind of the nature of our, our business, I guess, as personal injury lawyers. We talk at that point about uh, insurance limits. Um, we talk to the client about uh, what type of coverage is available if we have that information from maybe a, an oral uh, a, a verbal representation of insurance from the insurance adjuster. Um, and that's important because at that point the client knows or at least has an idea of what maybe the cap of his, his or her claim may be. If a party, uh, if a tort fees or a responsible party has a 1020 policy and uh, there's one person involved in the accident, your client, um, the maximum they have to recover at that point is a $10,000 under most circumstances. So the client needs to know uh, what that maximum recovery would be. Certainly if there's a million dollar policy and your client uh, has a minor injury, you, you let them know that the, the maximum is a million dollars, but you certainly try to maintain expectations uh, in the, in the, uh, to make them reasonable, to have the client have a reasonable expectation of what, um, what they should expect upon settlement. Uh, we talk about client behavior. Um, this is very important, uh, especially in this day and age of, of, of the many different forms of social media. Um, insurance companies have access to um, Facebook accounts, uh, Instagram accounts, Kick, Snapchat, you name it, they have access to that and they search that, that, uh, those various forms of social media. Um, so we certainly tell our clients not to post any information about the accident, not to post anything relative uh, to their condition or what they're doing on any social media platform while the case is being negotiated or while the claim is still open. If they have a, um, if they have a social media account, we recommend that they stop, shut it down or at least make it private. Um, because uh, those are the type of things that can really hurt negotiations. Believe it or not, I had a situation where I had a client who was involved in an accident, um, and, um, you know, it always happens a client will feel better and they'll do something. Unfortunately, the insurance company, um, you know, gets a copy of that. They get a Facebook posting of, uh, of, of, of maybe your client out at a restaurant, and, it's used against your client to devalue um, the client's claim or make minim uh, to minimize the type of problems your client may have. So um, you have to be careful of that and constantly warn your client 
Uh, in fact, we have a, a form that we ask the we we give the client, letting them know about these very things related to social media, and we ask them to sign that. Um, so if anything happens with regard to social media that, that devalues their claim, we say, look, we told you about it, and here's a document that you signed uh, to, to cooperate with us with regard to social media. The possibility of surveillance, uh, we tell the client to be careful what they do because they never know who, uh, when the insurance company may have someone out uh, getting surveillance of them. Statements against interest. Um, we we uh, also advise the client during that meeting to make sure that they don't make any statements or any admissions to anyone uh, about the accident. Uh, make sure any comments about the action are limited to uh, conversations uh, with the law firm so that they maintain the attorney-client privilege. <coughs> Once we've met with the client and decided to uh, take the claim, we have um, various uh, disclosure documents and retainer agreements um, that we have the clients sign. We have a HIP authorization. Uh, actually, let me back up to the um, retainer agreement. It's actually a statement of client rights and, and a contract to represent. The contract we use is um, a contract that is um, it, it's, it's a form that the Florida Bar approved. We use a Florida Bar approved form. Uh, we find that um, there's no need to deviate from that form, uh, and it, it's a form that uh, has already been approved by the bar, so you won't have any problems with regard to fee structure or language. Um, with the statement of client rights, um, there are a couple things that I like to go over with the client. Um, I, I let them know um, that this is a contingent fee contract that may be canceled at any time and that they have a, uh, three business days to cancel it um, and it basically voids the agreement um, without any harm to them. Um, I also let them know that they have a right to know about our law firm before signing any agreement with us. Um, the other thing I tell the client, I point out in the um, uh, statement of client rights, is that uh, once the case is resolved, they'll have a chance to uh, receive a settlement statement that they have to uh, review and approve before anyone gets any money. And I think the client appreciates the fact that they have the, the final say-so in when their case gets resolved. Um, and that, that we can't just get our money and, and leave the client hanging on a limb. They understand at that point that, that they have some say-so in, in how, when, and under what terms our case gets resolved. So I like to point that out to give them a little bit more comfort uh, in the process. Uh, the other thing I point out is a number for the Florida Bar. I uh, let them know that they have an issue uh, with me that they can't resolve after uh, making reasonable, uh, diligent efforts to get it resolved, that, um, that I have no problem with them calling the Florida Bar. I have not had a client uh, call the Florida Bar on me. Uh, I try to uh, make sure that I address client needs in, a, in, a, in as quickly as possible, and that's the easiest way to keep a client from calling the Florida Bar. Uh, the next one is the actual contract, um, and it's the contract sets out the fee structure. Uh, I advise clients that um, we are entitled to 33 and a third of any recovery that we get from the client. I let them know that if, uh, as long as the case, if we have not filed a lawsuit and an answer has not been filed, uh, that that our fee will be 33 and a third plus recovery of cost. Um, if if a lawsuit is filed, we do let the client know that because of what we will have to do in the way of filing a lawsuit, uh, depositions, discovery, uh, hearings, and things of that nature, that our fee does go up to 40%. Uh, there is a tiered structure of, of, of cases uh, up to a million dollars and above a million dollars, uh, and that's set forth in that contract as well. Uh, the one thing I also go over with the client is that uh, they won't owe us any money unless we're able to recover money for them with regard to fees. Uh, and with regard to cost, I, the vast majority of the law firms, at least the ones that I know, um, do not make clients pay cost. Um, the, the vast majority of them waive cost uh, if there is no recovery for the client. If there is a recovery, then the cost, like the attorney fees, are paid at the time of closing. Uh, the, the other form we get is a HIPAA authorization. Uh, many of you are familiar or will certainly become familiar with the HIPAA authorization. Uh, this form allows us to get the medical records uh, related to our client's treatment for the automobile accident. Uh, the client will need to sign that, uh, print it with their Social Security number and their date of birth, and we provide those to the medical providers. Um, 
the other document that we ha you'll see um, oftentimes, at least now that we have them signed, um, is a Medicare consent to release form. Um, what insurance companies have to be careful of nowadays is that there's no um, that Medicare doesn't come back on them for any medical bills that were paid that the client doesn't satisfy. So uh, right off the bat, the insurance companies want to know whether the client has any Medicare eligibility, if there needs to be any Medicare set aside in the event of a larger recovery. So what we do is we have the client sign that Medicare consent to release form at that initial meeting when we get the retainer or when we get the settlement statement or the contract to represent and the statement of client rights. Authorization to sign settlement draft. Uh, we have uh, used this document in the past to, especially if we have a client that travels or a client that may have been here um, uh, for a short period of time on vacation involved in an accident and had to go back to their home state. This document allows us to sign the settlement draft on behalf of the client to deposit in our trust account and disperse the funds to the client. Um, that way the client isn't inconvenienced. We don't have to send the check to the client, have it sent back to us, sign it, sent back to the insurance company or deposit into the account. Uh, it, it's, it's merely it's a matter of convenience to the client. It's not anything that is required for the client to sign in order for us to represent them. Research and analysis. Uh, once we've um, kind of gotten down the road and we're going to represent the client, we do a little bit more research and determine um, what type of value the claim may have. Obviously, because this is a contingent fee case, you have to be careful about the cases that you take that, that don't amount to any recover for you because you know, your time is valuable. And in contingent fee cases, uh, if you spend too much time on cases that don't have a good rate of return, you're not going to be in business very long. So you have to be mindful of that. Also, you know, the costs start right, racking up because you're ordering medical records, you're ordering police reports and things of that nature, uh, and those all cost money, and you can't afford to continue eating those costs without uh, having a claim in which you recover. So we, we go through the background, uh, we check on the parties, we do a background check on the parties to see what type of uh, assets maybe a, a party may have. This happens a lot in your um, slip and fall situations that on premises liability claims. We look to find out what type of assets the homeowner may have um, that may cover claims, uh, or premises liability claims. Uh, we do background checks on a potential client. Uh, we actually do our own social media search to make sure there's no uh, damaging information that may uh, affect the value of our client's claim. Um, we do initial value of research on the case, uh, and, and that's something that we do. We, we roundtable the cases here in our office with other attorneys. Uh, our firm is fortunate that we actually have an, uh, attorneys in our office that do insurance defense work. So, you know, I will frequently bounce cases off them to determine value or get an idea of value from a conservative standpoint. Um, so that helps in determining the value of the case. Um, we obtain the crash report uh, to see if there are any statements that may be detrimental to our client on the crash report. We make sure there is not anything that needs to be corrected uh, that may be, um, may be incorrect on the accident report that we need to have corrected based on witness statements or testimony from our client. Um, the other thing we do is we, uh, we contact all insurance companies and try to at least get a verbal on the amount of insurance uh, available for the accident. That, again, lets us know what type of claim we're dealing with. Some insurance companies um, require you to have a formal letter of representation, which we'll talk about a little bit later before they'll disclose any policy information. Other insurance companies will give verbals, especially if it's an adjuster that you've worked with before. Um, PIP and the EMC 14-day deadline. Uh, PIP, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of is, is is one of those three phases of the lawsuit when a person is involved in an accident. Uh, Florida is a no-fault state, uh, which means that no matter who's at fault, your client's insurance company pays for the first ten thousand dollars of medical expenses up to eighty percent. Um, so, you know, I have clients who get upset about that. They they wonder if their insurance is going to go up. Um, and, and honestly, there's no way you can guarantee that their rates won't go up. But I tell clients that insurance companies raise rates all the time, and a lot of times it has nothing to do with you being in an auto accident at all. Um, 
What you do have to be mindful of uh, is insurance companies, if you're involved in, uh, if you make more than uh, two or more in, uh, PIP claims within a six-month period, that will get flagged by the insurance company, and it could potentially result in your client's insurance uh, being, your insurance company dropping them from coverage. So you need to make sure that, um, you know, obviously insurance companies did that to prevent fraudulent uh, claims and clients who just made PIP claims one after the other uh, that were not legitimate. Uh, what it does do is it does hurt those individuals who just have bad luck of being in accidents within that six-month period. Um, what is the 14-day deadline? Um, the 14-day deadline essentially requires, under uh, Florida Statute 627.36, requires your client to seek uh, medical treatment within 14 days after the accident, and you have to have what's called an EMC or an emergency medical condition established uh, by one of the providers provided in 627.36. And they have to determine that the injured person has an emergency medical condition, condition that requires treatment. Um, that determination does not need to be made within 14 days. And some insurance companies will try to limit um, your, your, uh, your PIP benefits based on the, the EMC not being determined within that time uh, or an EMC letter being provided to them within that 14-day period. That is not what the statute requires. It just requires treatment that... Uh, resulted in emergency medical condition within a 14-day period. Now, if your client does not seek treatment within that 14-day period, uh, his or her insurance benefits or personal injury protection benefits could be limited from $10,000 to $2,500. So you have to be mindful of that when the client calls in as to when the accident happened so that they can get in and get medical treatment as soon as possible. We talk with the client about the statute of limitations. Um, in Florida, the uh, statute of limitations for a BI claim, a bodily injury claim, is four years, uh, with the statute of limitations uh, being uh, five years for um, a uninsured motorist claim or a claim against your own insurance company. Um, the statute of limitations uh, for uh, we, we also, uh, one area that, uh, that a new lawyer can, can get in trouble with is claims against governmental agencies. Um, if, if I, let me back up a moment. Um, we let the client know, or one thing you should point out in, in um, the uh, bodily injury claim versus an uninsured motorist or underinsured motorist claim is the, um, the complaint in a bodily injury claim is brought against the individual. The complaint in a... Um, uninsured motorist claim or uh, underinsured motorist claim is barred against the actual insurance company because in essence you're suing uh, your insurance company for breach of contract, i.e. not resolving the claim reasonably during the pre-suit stages if a lawsuit has to be filed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the areas uh, that a new lawyer can get in trouble is when there's a claim against a governmental agency. Uh, the statute of limitations is four years. However, Florida Statute 768.28 requires you to file what's called a notice of claim with the uh, insurance commission within three years of the date of the accident. So although that statute of limitations is four years, if you don't file that notice of claim, you can't get into court at that time and you will commit malpractice. The other thing that you have to be aware of is that sovereign immunity policy limits are 200, 300, meaning 200 for any one individual and $300,000 for any one claim um, for all parties involved. Uh, one of the things um, that we do and I have here on the, on the PowerPoint is a no rep letter. If we've looked into the claim and determined either that there's not enough insurance or there's going to be a problem with determining liability or getting a good value or settlement for the claim for the client, we do send out a no rep letter. And this is something that you want to send out as soon as possible when you determine that you can't help this particular individual. In that rep letter, uh, we, we, we inform the potential client that we're not representing them, that we won't take any further action on their behalf. We also advise them of the applicable statute of limitations and, it, and, 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 and encourage them to seek a second opinion as soon as possible.
initial steps. Um, we get the letters of uh, before we once we we have the client signed up and we're moving forward. We get the letters of representation out to the insurance companies. Uh, these rep letters um, we send out to our clients insurance company as well as the tortfeasors insurance company. We seek um, insurance information uh, deck sheet and the policy from the tortfeasors insurance company. We also seek the deck sheet and policy from our uh, insured or from our client's insurance company. And that's important because if your client has a significant injury and the tortfeasor has little to no insurance, then what you have to do is determine if there's uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage that would help uh, your client and provide compensation for their injuries. Uh, if, if the deck sheet shows that uninsured motorist coverage does not exist on your client's policy, we like to have the policy and any rejection letters because if the insurance company did not provide or did not have the client specifically reject uninsured motorist coverage, then your client would be entitled to uninsured motorist coverage in an amount equal to the bodily injury coverage that they carry. Um, you, you can't just rely on the, insur on the, in on the client as well uh, because most people will come in and say, oh, I have full coverage. What they don't realize is that the insurance companies in, in the state of Florida, that full coverage is a very limited type of coverage that you have. You have property damage coverage and you have PIP. Uh, you don't have to have bodily injury coverage and you don't have to have uninsured motorist coverage, nor do you have to have um, uh, insurance to fix your own vehicle. Uh, you have to have insurance to fix the other person's vehicle and you have to carry PIP. Uh, so when they say uh, the client says they have full coverage, you have to take that with a grain of salt and send out that, that, that rep letter to get their actual insurance policy and deck sheet from their insurance company. We go through the process also of getting medical records and medical bills related to the accident. We get medical bills and records from prior injuries. Uh, this gets us a picture of the client's medical history or the medical picture to see what we're dealing with. Um, at that point, we get uh, a medical summary, the paralegal or legal assistant, and uh, very rarely will I have to do it, but if you're a one-person shop, then uh, you're going to have to do this part on your own. Uh, you're going to have to go through and do a medical summary. Uh, it's important to have that medical summary so that you're not flipping through every uh, record when you talk to the adjuster or you talk to the client. The client wants you to be well aware of what type of injury they sustained and their medical history. You have to be well versed about your client's medical history and you have to go through those medical records. Uh, there are occasions where the client will have a past medical injury and simply forget about it or they think it's not important. And if you haven't reviewed those medical records, those past medical records, then you could be setting yourself up, up, yourself up for failure and, and not looking too uh, good in the, in the side of the insurance adjuster or your client if there is a condition in there that you flat out miss by not looking at the medical records. The medical bill summary uh, is something that we prepare to give us a quick uh, breakdown of what our client's medical, um, medical uh, bills look like. Uh, I did see a question here of a no rep letter after signing a contract. Can you do that? Yes, you can. You can always uh, fire a client if if for, if you realize that pursuing the claim is not in the best interest of the client or not in your best interest. Um, if you do fire the client, uh, you still have to make sure you give them the applicable statute limitations. And if you're going to do that, you want to do that as soon as possible, uh, so that the client doesn't. Uh, say that you, you, you uh, held their case in some way uh, damaged their ability to get a fair and, and reasonable uh, settlement for their claim. Um, one thing you might want to know that um, that uh, if you if you have to fire a client, uh, you 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 will likely waive any uh, recovery or lien uh, that you may have for any work that you provided uh, prior to terminating the client. So. Um, you know, if you if you see that the, the relationship just isn't working, or the client isn't being truthful, or you're not in uh, having a good relationship with the client, and you need to get out, you can certainly do that after signing a contract. It is a lot harder to get out after filing suit. Uh, you have to do a, a, a motion to withdraw, uh, 
and, and, and you run the risk of the court saying, uh, no, Mr. Lawyer, I'm not letting you out because you know, your client is set for trial or your client is set for deposition. Uh, those are situations where once a lawsuit is filed, um, you want to really have to have, you have to really have a good reason to just flat out withdraw from your client uh, because the courts uh, frown upon withdrawal after the lawsuit is filed. Letters of protection. Um, what are letters of protection? Letters of protection are uh, uh, letters that we give to medical providers letting them know that if they treat our client um, essentially on credit, that before we disperse any funds to the client, we will resolve any outstanding medical bill that they may have related to their treatment. Well, why would you do a letter of, a letter of protection? A letter of protection would be necessary when your client has exhausted their PIP coverage and they don't have health insurance and they can't afford to pay the out-of-pocket cost to get the continued medical treatment that they need to get better. Um, doctors will often allow the lawyer to give them a letter of protection. And, and those uh, factors that go into whether a, a doctor is going to accept the letter of protection or whether you should give a letter of protection are the insurance limits. Uh, if you have a $10,000 policy and your client is exhausted PIP, you want to be careful about giving a letter of protection because if that doctor runs up a big medical bill and you're only looking at a $10,000 recovery, your client's going to be really disappointed when they have to pay out all their money in medical bills and lawyer fees and nothing goes into their pocket. Um, which brings me to an important point. Um, you, you really have to um, keep a handle on what your client's medical bills are because what you, what you don't want to get into the habit of doing is getting more, cli more money than your client. You want to always try to leave your client in a good state when they leave your office because that is going to be a good referral source, which we'll talk about later. Um, your relationship with a medical provider is also a factor when determining whether you give a letter of protection to a doctor. Uh, if it's a physician or chiropractor that you've worked with in the past, they may be more apt to accept a letter of protection. You also want to make sure that you don't mess up any relationship with that physician by giving letters of protection when you know there's no way to recover on behalf of your client. And finally, you look at the client's financial status. Uh, you want to make sure that the client, if they don't have a favorable recovery, that uh, they will have the ability to negotiate and work out some sort of payment plan with that medical provider. The demand itself. Um, when do you send a demand? Well, you look at the demand uh, as the letter you sent to the insurance company saying, hey, we're ready to start negotiating. And it depends on the case. We have to take into consideration uh, the limits of insurance there are some situations where you may send out a demand pretty quickly if there are low limits and your client has a significant injury. If your client has sustained a broken bone or uh, it's determined immediately that your client needs surgery and there's a $10,000 policy, you want to send out that demand immediately uh, for a couple reasons. One, you, you know that your client's injuries uh, warrant, excuse me, that policy limit, that low policy limit, and, and sometimes uh, quite frankly, if the insurance company fails to tender um, their, low, their low limits uh, in a timely manner, then they may be looking at a bad faith or an excess judgment, which may result in a greater recovery for your client. Uh, you also look at the client's injuries, which is what I mentioned earlier. If your client has significant injuries and there's a low limit policy, then you may want to go ahead and get that demand out as quickly as possible. Um, maximum medical improvement. Uh, this is uh, usually achieved by most clients in a five to seven month period, six to eight month period. Um, and basically, it's as healthy. It means that your client is as healthy as they're going to get. Does it mean that they're getting better? Not necessarily, but it means that they're not getting worse. Um, and once your, your client's physician has placed them at maximum medical improvement, then that way you know you're ready to start moving forward with your demand. Um, financial status of the client. Um, medical insurance or letters of protection, you want to take a look at those when you determine uh, when you send out your demand. Uh, if there's any outstanding medical bills, uh, if, for instance, your client has um, Medicare, 
uh, or a health insurance that may wait to bill if you're able to get the demand out and get it resolved before um, that huge lien hits, uh, you're, you have a better chance of negotiating those medical bills down. The demand itself, um, what do we include in our demand letters? Obviously, we include the facts of the accident. Um, we're specific about how the accident happened. Uh, we determine uh, and explain our theory of liability, and uh, usually we spe have a specific statement of no liability on the part of our client. Um, medical bills. We include the medical bills and the medical bill breakdown in our demand letter. We talk about the past and future pain and suffering that our client has as a result of the accident. We talk about how our client has their lifestyle has been changed, how they will have to change their daily activities. And it may not necessarily be that our client can no longer do certain activities, but their activity level is limited, or they may be able to still perform the same activities that they were able to perform prior to the accident, but they're, but they're doing it now with greater pain or pain after doing it. Future medical expenses, we make sure we include the, that amount uh, in our element of damages when we send out our demand letter. The demand package itself, we usually include uh, on a CD that we send to the insurance company, and on that, in that package, uh, we include the medical records, medic, all the medical bills, photos of the crash and any injuries that we may have of the client, the crash report, and any other documentation that may help tell our client's story. Once the insurance company, uh, and those demand letters go out usually with uh, a 15 to 30 day, in some cases a 45 day time for the insurance company to respond. Once the insurance company gets the demand letter, the negotiations start. Um, very rarely, um, uh, the insurance companies will try to will try to uh, give you a low ball offer. Uh, you have an obligation to communicate any and all offers to your client because they actually have the they have the authority to determine whether they will accept or reject an offer from the insurance company. So make sure when you get that initial offer, no matter how low it is, and and no matter uh, if you are 100 or, or 99 percent sure your client is going to reject that offer from the insurance company you still have to convey that offer to the client. I like to convey that offer in writing just so the client knows what's been conveyed to the insurance company. At that point, I take time to find out uh, how the client is doing and what the client is actually looking for um, when, you, uh, when you actually settle. So I get, at that point, a conversation with the client to to, to find out how their, their medical treatment is progressing, how their injury is progressing, if they're still having pain or not. Um, we talk with the client to make sure that they don't do anything in the interim to uh, compromise their claim while we're in negotiations with the insurance company. Like I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that there's no negative video surveillance of your client um, that may hamper you uh, in resolving your case. During the negotiations with the insurance adjuster, we bolster the client's claim. We, um, this is your time to really sell your client's claim, uh, sell their injury, and tell how this accident has affected your client. In order to do that, you have to talk with your client. You have to know what he or she can't do anymore, what he or she uh, is limited in doing. So you have to really have a, a conversation with your client prior to sending that demand out so that you know exactly what's going on with your client. Um, during the negotiations with the insurance company, um, you may, uh, your insurance company may d ask for what's called a CME or a compulsory medical exam. Uh, this is usually done pre-suit by your own insurance company. Uh, they want to make sure that the medical treatment that you're getting and the PIP benefits that they're paying out are uh, reasonably related to an accident and that they're legitimate. Um, you will get a, a CME or uh, requested by the tort fees of the insurance company after lawsuit is filed, and that is done uh, by the other person's insurance company uh, to determine whether you actually have an injury and whether it's related to the automobile accident. And routinely, those uh, 
compulsory medical evaluations done, exams done after a lawsuit is filed, as you might imagine, are quite favorable to the insurance company. Settlement itself. Um, you finally get to a point with the insurance company where they realize that you are right, that you have uh, the better value for your client's claim, and they are ready to settle your client's case. Um, what do you do at that point? At that point, uh, you've communicated to your client They've accepted the offer from the insurance company. At that point, you start going into medical bill reduction mode because what you want to do at settlement is you want to try to put as much money in your client's po money as in your client's pocket as possible. Um, so you do that by negotiating the medical bills. You call your treating physicians. You see what they've already been paid. See if they will be willing to take reductions in their, any outstanding balances that they have. And in, or, in any amount that you're able to save on those medical bills goes directly into the client's pocket, and that goes a long way into uh, fostering a great relationship with your client. I like to tell my clients, once the case has gotten to the point where we've settled with the insurance company, at that point their case goes from the best case in the world to the worst case in the world um, because they weren't paid. Uh, nine times out of ten, they haven't been paid what you were hoping to get, and you communicate that to the doctor or medical provider so you can get that reduction for your client. Um, and, and oftentimes, medical providers are willing to take those reductions because they've gotten most of their money through the insurance companies, uh, either through PIP or health insurance. If they haven't and they are a letter of protection, they want to get something rather than nothing because they realize if the client ultimately decides that, hey, this isn't enough money in my pocket, I don't want to do anything yet, uh, those medical providers won't get paid anything or they'll wait a long time to get paid for the services that they've rendered. Um, releases. Um, once you settle the claim, the insurance company will send you a release. We have our own releases that we prepare because there are specific things that we like to exclude from the lease or, or certain benefits that we like to preserve. For instance, if this is a claim against uh, a third party, then you may want to preserve any first party claims. Uh, if you have a claim against another party, you sign that release, you release that claim only and specifically that claim. We have our clients and our releases that we sign preserve any claim for any uninsured motorist coverage that may be out there relative to the accident, any uh, outstanding medical benefits that might be payable to the client either through PIP or health insurance, and we specifically reserve any claim that uh, a client may have for medical malpractice that happened as a result of the auto accident. And finally, we make sure we preserve the claim that we don't waive or release any party not specifically named in the release uh, in the event there was another party that may have caused harm to our client, we want to make sure that they don't get released uh, without paying any valuable consideration. Uh, again, the insurance company will draft those releases. Um, as a new lawyer, you certainly want to make sure you read, release, read those releases and make sure they have the protection language in there for your client. Uh, they will, insurance companies will also ask for confidentiality clauses which I routinely uh, strike out unless it's something that has been bargained for. Um, and you have to be careful with those confidentiality clauses nowadays because uh, typically your personal injury settlement cases are uh, for pain and suffering and they are not uh, taxable. I, I do tell my clients that I'm not an accountant, that they need to report any personal injury uh, settlement to their accountant and make sure it's properly reported to them to determine whether it's taxable. But in my years of experience, I have not had a client come back to me and tell me that they were taxed on their personal injury claim. Now, I say that with the caveat that if, if there's a lost wage claim that you have, it's potentially, it, it's possible that they could be taxed on those lost wages that they get compensation for. The other thing if, that I mentioned before is a confidentiality clause. There is a possibility that the insurance company or, or that your client could get taxed uh, for uh, any amount paid for the confidentiality clause as opposed to those amounts paid for pain and suffering. Um, I have not had that particular situation happen, but I have seen um, articles advising against confidentiality clauses and making sure that your client, um, your client uh, tax consequences 
are not affected by a confidentiality clause. So before you sign it, you may very well want to talk with a an account a certified public accountant um, to to address that situation. Um, the final meeting with the client, um, or I'm sorry, the settlement statement that you have. Um, I apologize. I didn't. My first, um, my first uh, webinar here, and I, I don't know if I moved the slide. So I'm at the settlement stage, and I should be on the slide that has the settlement statement uh, and the four things that we're talking about here. Um, the settlement statement itself, we we show the amount of money that we receive from the insurance company. Um, then we show how much money, uh, how, what our fee is for that particular case. We show any cost that we incurred. We show the outstanding medical bills that will be paid on behalf of the client. And then we show that net amount to the client. Um, the settlement statement has to be approved and signed by the client before any money is dispersed. And in that settlement statement, we have language um, that uh, specifically talks about the medical providers that the client saw. Uh, we want the client to specifically tell us what client, what medical providers that they, what medical providers they treated with, and and advise them that if they've treated with medical providers, excuse me, that they didn't tell us about, then they will be responsible for satisfying any expenses or costs uh, that were incurred for that treatment. Um, the other thing we do on our medical statements that we, or our settlement statements that we've started doing recently, is including a a section for them to sign if they want their medical records. Uh, we have a section of the settlement statement that asks the client if they want their medical records. Uh, we also have them specifically acknowledge that we will be uh, destroying the medical records uh, after the proper time frame. Uh, what we do if the client requests a record is we put the records on a jump drive uh, as opposed to making paper copies. We found that clients like to have their medical records and their file on a jump drive. So what we've done now is we've started um, using it actually as a marketing opportunity because we have our logo on the jump drive and we'll put the client's medical records and settlement statement on a jump drive and give it to the client. Uh, and it helps the client. It also is a, a, a longer-term marketing opportunity for us to stay uh, in sight uh, and in the mind of the client. And that final meeting with the client, uh, we like to make sure we have that meeting in person. I always like to give the client their settlement statement or their